Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to present uh, something uh, uh, about uh, UV light. Luis asked me to give this presentation. And uh, well, in this presentation, I'm not going to talk just about UV light, but uh, about also other ranges of UV of uh, light uh, that uh, will help you to understand some aspects about uh, that you have to be aware if you are working with amphibians in captivity. Well, basically, you have uh, like the electromagnetic uh, spectrum where you have uh, ultraviolet light that you are. We are going to talk more about this uh, today, but also you have the visible light that we are able to to see and the infrared uh, radi radiation that is uh, responsible of the to uh, warm uh, things or to feel uh, the heat of in different. Uh, uh, ways. Uh, we are going to first uh, talk a little bit about the infrared uh, light that is uh, going to be also affecting uh, the behavior and nutrition of uh, amphibians. Like we saw in the, the other day that um, uh, temperature is a factor that is influencing a lot the digestion and the assimilation of nutrients in, in amphibians, depending on how warm or cold is the uh, system. And amphibians, as you know, they are like uh, very dependent of uh, temperature. They are uh, cold-blooded uh, vertebrates, so they're going to be very dependent. If it's cold, the metabolic rate is going to low down and almost no metabolic uh, functions are going to be active but if it, temperature goes up it's uh, going to increase the metabolic rate and um, basically well uh, as i said amphibians depends of uh, depend of uh, temperature in the environment and uh, that is going to uh, affect the uh, the development, nutrition, reproduction of the different species. And in this case, uh, talking about nutrition is, is going to have a big impact uh, with these species. And some species, for example, are tolerant to very cold uh, environments, but other ones are not active if temperatures go below 15 degrees, for example. So it depends of also of the species. And this is one thing that you need to be aware to know your species, which kind of ranges your species uh, accepts or they are feeling uh, good. And there are like uh, different aspects that we need to take in account. Like uh, if we are talking about the temperature and budget of the amphibian, for example, what kind of inputs or which way the amphibians get uh, some uh, warmth and the ways can be solar radiation for example if they go in the sun and they bust over there they're going to also get some uh, heat over there and they, they're going to warm up uh, through the uh, infrared radiation but also they can get uh, some uh, temperature change with uh, convection or conduction depending of where they are located and also through condensation they are going to have some increase of temperature or uh, in a very small uh, scale also there is reported that some amphibians produce uh, some uh, warmth they basically storage the temperature in a difference of temperature depending for example if they bask in a warm area and then they can storage this uh, temperature if they move to other cooler area and this is so one way that they can thermoregulate uh, the temperature in this way. For example, if the habitat is uh, not uh, too warm, they can go to a small micro habitat that is warmer, get the temperature that they need, and then to use it in the area, in the biggest uh, matrix where they are living. And the way that they lose this uh, temperature is uh, by via evaporation so the warmth is going to go from a cooler to warmer area and infrared radiation and also via convection and conduction and we need to be also aware for each species which are the ideal temperature and the critical temperature uh, 
where the species can survive because an Amazonian species is going to be different than a high Andean species, for example. You have uh, some aquatic frogs of Dermatobia genus that can survive minus two degrees without any problems, but if you put at that temperature to an Amazonian forest uh, species, they're going to die basically. So depending on the species that you're working with, you should know these ranges and uh, to try to replicate in captivity. And uh, depending on the temperature, you have different uh, stages where the species is going to have like uh, different strategies to protect themselves and also to survive in the different temperatures. Like you have uh, some torpor, hyperactivity, if you, if it's too hot, dehydration, if it's hot and dry, or hibernation, estivation, if it's too cold, or if these temperatures are extreme, they can also basically die. So, like I told you once again, you need to be aware of, with the species that you are working with. And depending on the species, you have different uh, kind of ranges for uh, species that live in desert, savannas, or Arctic areas, so, or temperature ranges where the different species are going to be used to, uh, to live. And you should be uh, replicating this in captivity. And uh, there are different ways that uh, amphibians can uh, thermoregulate, like I told you. Some of them, they're just basking uh, during the day to get some solar radiation. In this way, they're going to uh, increase the temperature. And these changes can be like behavioral changing uh, or choosing different habitats. Or also, for example, with electronic or thermothermy, getting uh, direct sun or also just getting uh, sun from other uh, sources like rocks. And there are also, especially in larvae, that you have some aggregations of uh, tadpoles that are going to increase the temperature a little bit. So in this way, they're going to increase also the metabolic rates. And there is also there are also metabolic uh, ways to thermoregulate with evaporation, color change, or hibernation. And for example, in color change, you have this uh, frog in the picture, like it's a high Andean uh, uh, South America high Andean uh, species, a frog, a tree frog. And one individual in one day can have different colors. For example, this is a color that you normally observe during the, the night, but they are pale when they are uh, uh, early in the morning, but then at 10 o'clock in the morning, they can be almost uh, black. So it changed a lot, the color, just depending on the temperature. For example, if they need to get uh, uh, this sun, uh, they, they got uh, very dark. And once they are very warm, they go pale in the same day. So it's a strategy to thermoregulate in this way to survive in these extreme conditions in the high Andean mountains. And also, uh, temperature is going to affect the feeding of the frogs. If, for example, for some species, if it's too hot or if it's too cold, uh, the frogs are going to stop uh, feeding. They're not going to eat uh, as they should. And uh, even if the temperatures are not so extreme, they can uh, also slow down the metabolic rate and the assimilation of the different nutrients. And this, at the end, can uh, have some issues in the body condition of the frog or the health status of the frog. So we also need to be aware about, about these extremes and also not so extreme conditions, uh, talking about temperature. And there is also uh, uh, an effect in the development. Some, uh, uh, tadpoles are going to develop faster or slower depending on the temperature and also the size of the individuals are going to be affected by the temperature and this you need to be if you are working in a habitat you should know not just the big habitat where the frog lives but the micro habitats because all these small micro habitats are going to have different temperatures and different uh, uh, incidence of light of the sun in this way is going to be warmer or colder, cooler, 
and the frog is choosing this. And so you should know also the natural history of the species to see where the frog is choosing to, to live. In this case, you have to replicate these uh, conditions in captivity. Another part of the electromagnetic spectrum is the visible light. You have uh, all the light that we can see. And this is, uh, for even for us, is very important because uh, you have this uh, spectrum that allows you to see your prey items if you are a frog or to try to find your other uh, um, individuals of the species uh, and well amphibians uh, most of them uh, frogs especially they communicate via calls but uh, or hormones but some some others they are uh, using visual communication like uh, some atelopus for example they be the behavior uh, if they don't have light they are not going to be able to see that um well like I told you, these, there are some species like uh, they are uh, communicating via movements that needs to be seen uh, in the light and also to find the, the food. So amphibians also need to see and for that it's necessary to have light. Another part of the spectrum is the UVC, UVB, and UVA, the ultraviolet uh, light. This is the area where we are going to give more detail. And uh, I'm going to explain this is uh, between a range of 400 to 100 uh, nanometers, uh, where you have these uh, two main groups of UV light. And uh, UV light is uh, one of uh, just one range of the all the spectrum that we receive in uh, planet Earth from the sun, and in this uh, radiation, most of the light is uh, going to the tropics. Here you can see a map where red is uh, with higher levels of UV light and. Uh, the blue is the one that is getting less. So if you see the tropics are the areas where you have more UV radiation. If you're working, for example, with European species, you, you should know that they don't need too much uh, UV light, like for example, uh, high Andean species in the tropics. This is, for example, in the months where most radiation, uh, highest radiation uh, is, uh, in normally in uh, also in the Andes where you have a lot of uh, UV radiation, not just because of the latitudes, but also because of the altitude that has an impact of the UV levels that the species receive over there. And this is, for example, another graph with uh, in winter where you have uh, lower much lower radiation almost nothing of radiation in europe uh, or in in the poles but still some radiation in uh, in the tropics so this uh range of uh uv radiation is changed uh, during the months and also during the hours because for example you have in winter less radiation but also is it goes with the sun uh, of the lights of the sun so in the morning is going to be less uv in midday is going to be the highest are going to be the highest levels and then it's going to decrease uh, where there is uh, no uv radiation during the night and like i told you it's also going to be dependent of the latitudes depending on the inclination of the earth you're going to have more uh, solar radiation in the tropics and less in the poles, and that is going to affect also the UV. Altitude is an, uh, also a parameter that uh, has an effect in UV radiation that is the species are getting, because uh, lower areas like sea level uh, forests is going to get less radiation than uh, High and then mountains for, because the light has to travel less distance and in this way higher areas are going to receive more UV radiation. Also, another aspect that we need to be aware of is like the ozone. Like uh, ozone is uh, uh, filtering the UV radiation uh, in the globe, and when you have uh, 
thinner layer of ozone, the UV radiation is going to be able to pass uh, in an easier way. And so you are going to have uh, higher levels of UV in the in these areas. And normally, depending on where the uh, ozone layer is uh, thinner, you are going to get more uh, UV. And for example, this is a study where it's showing that, for example, in this area, Peru, Bolivia, and Chile, you have uh, you had levels of uh, ozone that were very thin, and the UV radiation were very very high in these years. Like it was in 2015, for example, that levels of UV radiation were very high in these areas. And also, you need to be aware about the kind of habitat where your species is uh, living, because it's not going to be the same if your uh, frog lives in a forest or if it lives in the high Andean mountains without any forest. The UV that they are going to get are going to be completely different. One is like uh, the altitude and everything, but also the forest, the trees are going to work as a filter that doesn't allow the UV light to pass to the, for example, to the ground level. Things that will not happen in the high Andean mountains where you don't have uh, trees and the UV radiation is going to get directly to the folks that are living over there. So there are all these aspects that I was talking about that we need, we should be aware if we are going to work with amphibians and uh, to see Depending on the species that we are working, we are going to know in which uh, if they are a tropical or species that uh, lives in a temperate area or high altitude, low altitude, in the forest, in the open area. And depending on that, they are going to be exposed to certain levels of UV radiation. And if we are one, if we want to work in, uh, with captive populations of these species, we should know all this information to try to replicate in captivity. And we do that with uh, normally in uh, if you want to keep in a uh, in good biosecurity levels with UV lamps that uh, produce UV radiation, and in this way you can replicate uh, the UV that they normally should get in uh, in the wild. And there is also one aspect that we should uh, be aware is like, for example, uh, UV radiation, if it pass or not uh, water. And for example, when I was working with aquatic frogs, uh, with Titicaca water frog, uh, some people told me if you don't need to be, you know, you don't need to worry about uh, UV because the UV is not going to pass the water. But if you look for a couple of uh, papers and do some experiments, you see that UV also pass water and you have uh, like of course it's going to decrease the intensity but you have at uh, levels where the frog at least uh, the Tidiaga water frog was present you have uh, uv radiation that the frogs are getting and you can see that uh, also they need uh, uv radiation and also doing a, a small experiment you can see that uh, for example some UV radiation with some UV lamps, you can have like 100 centimeters, like 1.5 centimeters, you still have uh, UV radiation at these uh, depths. And like I told you, if you're working with uh, fully aquatic frogs, especially if the frog lives at five to 10 meters uh, depth, uh, you should also think about UV radiation. Uh, another part of the UV radiation that, uh, well, is if you split uh, normally the UV radiation in three, depending of the waves in UVA, UVB, and UVC, and uh, you have uh, these three um, le uh, like levels of UV. Uh, UVA is the lowest, and UVB is the medium, and UVC is the highest, and normally the one that is important for amphibians and reptiles is the medium that is uh, the UVB is uh, in charge of the um, synthesis of uh, vitamin D that is going to allow the absorption of uh, calcium in the in the body. I'm going to explain later about this, but also, for example, in humans, is the responsible of the change of the color of the skin, the UVB. 
the UVA is mainly uh, used for some uh, animals like uh, invertebrates or vertebrates in communication. Like for example, some of them are can find uh, other individuals like uh, scorpions or chameleons or bees or butterflies during the day, for example, that can get this uh, UVA that to find the flowers uh, in a more efficient way. And UVB, like I told you, is the responsible of the synthesis of vitamin D that is going to allow us to absorb or to get the calcium that we eat or drink uh, in our diet. The same with amphibians. This is the range of UV that uh, is important for the synthesis of vitamin D3. And the way that they, how it works, uh, uh, UV light to synthesize vitamin D3 uh, and also responsible for the absorption of calcium is like uh, you have this is an example in the epidermis or lizard skin where you have like the UV radiation that is going to act in the pro vitamin D. In this uh, way, the UVB is going to. Um, change the pro-vitamin D to pre-vitamin D3 that uh, with uh, warmth also normally from the same sun or when the frog is basking, for example, is going to uh, synthesize from pre-vitamin D3 to vitamin D3. All these are uh, in the skin of the lizard. That is also uh, the same case with um, that it's going to happen in the skin and then the vitamin D3 goes to the plasma and liver that is going to also uh, do uh, go to the kidney and other cells so uh, in, this, in the form of uh, calcetriol in this way is going to allow to absorb the calcium that the frog is ingesting through the diet in this way the calcium can be stored in the body of the frog. If the levels of vitamin D3, for example, are too low, the frog is not going to be able to absorb enough calcium. Even if you are giving them a lot of calcium, they're not going to be able to store it in the, in the body. So you don't need to think just about the diet, but also all these aspects like, for example, UV radiation and also infrared radiation like in, in form of heat that will allow you to have all this cycle complete and in this way is going to the frog is going to be able to absorb the calcium that is needed because if the frog for example has all the calcium that they need through the diet or more but they don't get any uv light they can have uh, problems or like metabolic bone disease because they are not going to be able to absorb this calcium and you should be aware that and for example when i was working at the beginning with these aquatic frogs because nobody told me well uh, some people told me that i don't need to be aware of, uh, worry about uh, uv light i had uh, some problems uh, about, uh, with metabolic bone disease with these aquatic frogs so even you if your frog is uh, not supposedly getting uv you should uh, give them and uh, also uh, there are some other uh, effects of UV radiation in uh, organisms that is going to help you to have healthy frogs. And you also need to, some people think about the frogs, uh, nocturnal frogs, they never get uh, UV or fossorial or aquatic frogs, they never get UV. Don't, don't forget that uh, if, for example, a nocturnal frog, maybe they're not getting uh, light UV radiation when they are active. But when they are sleeping, they, they sleep uh, under the leaves or in the trees or in other areas where they probably get also UV radiation when they are sleeping. Or fossorial or other species, maybe they are underground, but maybe there are some uh, uh, periods where they go out during the day and they get some uh, light. And also don't, don't, remember, don't forget that UV radiation it's not coming just directly from the sun, but also uh, there is some reflection and in this way they can get some uh, UV radiation. And so you should need, uh, you, you should know the natural history of the species. And of course, it's going to be probably 
a difference between a fossorial species and a tree tree frog that the tree frog is going to get more light than the fossorial but probably both of them are going to uh, need the UV radiation. Maybe the fossil in less amount than uh, the arboreal frogs in humans is, uh, for example, known that uh, people that live uh, in uh, the poles, they are adapted to have lower levels of vitamin D3. If you compare with people that live in uh, the tropics, for example, the vitamin D3 levels are much higher. And this is the way that they get the, you, uh, the vitamin D3 from the sun. Eh? But you have the Inuits, for example, that they get another way, the vitamin D3 that is not for the sun, but uh, it's a, a special uh, way that they uh, synthesize the vitamin D3. And you should also think about this kind of things uh, if you are working with uh, frogs. And like I told you, with uh, aquatic amphibians, you should think about uh, how much light they are getting or, or not, and also how much UV they are getting. Another uh, area of the UV radiation, you have the UVC that is more for uh, like a uh, harmful for cells and is more used to kill uh, um, microorganisms like uh, bacteria, fungus, or virus. And it's mainly used uh, in filters where you can. Uh, have water filters where they're getting UV light and kill everything and then your water comes in uh, to the system without any organisms that can uh, be dangerous for your frogs. And uh, how do you measure UV light? And well, uh, there are different machines that you can uh, use and uh, there are some of them are very expensive, but uh, for us that are working with uh, amphibians or reptiles, there are like some small machines that now is uh, very common to use in different um, zoos or uh, captive breeding programs that allows you to measure UV radiation. For example, you have this, uh, the UV index that allows you to see a specific range between 280 to 3,320 or the UV index that allows you from 280 to 400 uh, nanometers. So it's, they measure different uh, ranges of the UV radiation. And in this way, for example, you can measure the UV radiation uh, in your uh, habitat, depending on, for example, this is a graphic uh, in the, depending of the hour of the, uh, where the UV radiation is lower in the morning, higher in the midday and going low down uh, close to the night. And uh, depending also like uh, the locality is going to change. For example, this is a graph where the highest uh, UV radiation was uh, like 400, uh, 550 almost. But for example, in the Andes in Titicaca Lake, we measured like a level of 662 or something like that. For now, till now is the record that we found uh, of UV radiation uh, at uh, almost 4,000 meters above sea level where Titicaca water frog lives. So if you are working with uh, frogs, once again, you should know how much UV radiation they are getting uh, in the wild, depending on the microhabitat, the habitat, uh, the altitude kind of forest that they are uh, using. So in this way, you, you can try to replicate in captivity. And as I told you, you can also have UV lamps where you can uh, also measure the UV radiation and you can use also this uh, solar meters to measure the UV radiation that the lamp is producing. And there are different uh, UV lamps in the market that you can use and some of them are good for some things, some others for others and you should always also measure the UV radiation that your lamps are providing because after a while the radiation is going to change and depending on the species that you want to work with, you should see which kind of setup, which kind of lamp, how many lamps, which altitude, and all these aspects, because depending on the shape of the lamp, the kind of lamp, and uh, the position of the lamp, they are going to get different levels of UV radiation that in some occasions can be dangerous for the uh, frog, but uh, if there are good altitude, you can uh, avoid these problems. And so depending 
also the shape of the lamp is going to have different uh, profile of your UV radiation or the waves that you are going to get in the interim. Some of them are going to uh, share a lot of, uh, how do you say, spread a lot of uh, UV or some others not too much. So you, you need to see all this information once to, you want to decide to buy these uh, lamps, but also to monitor these lamps uh, from my to, uh, to well because uh, this radiation is going, also going to change because this is probably the radiation that the lamp produce when they're new, but after one week or two weeks, it's going to change or one month. I'm, I'm sure that after two, six months, some of them are not going to produce any more uh, UV radiation. So you need to monitor all the time your lamps. There are like different options in the market to uh to buy uh depending of the uv radiation and also uh, uh if some of them produce uh, heat some others not so you, you need to see all these kind of things and when you are uh buying uv uh, lamps you need to be also aware that some of them produce uvc that can be harmful for your frogs or amphibians but also there are some cases, for example, some zoos that uh, told me, yes, we have uh, UV lamps and uh, we give them to our reptiles and amphibians. And there were like uh, uh, good zoos and big zoos that I thought, yeah, uh, I'm sure that uh, their lamps are okay. But once we, we, we went to measure the, the lamps, the UV lamps were producing zero uh, UV radiation. So you need to also think about this and be careful about uh, this uh, situation because especially, for example, in South America, you have all these UV lamps that they said produce UV uh, radiation, but uh, they produce no UV radiation. And the idea is if you have a species that lives in a certain habitat to try to replicate in captivity with the same conditions. Uh, luminosity, UV, uh, infrared. In this way, the frog is going to be able to choose which kind of micro habitat uh, is better for this, the individual. Because if you have, for example, some areas where they can be good exposed to the UV, they can climb to these uh, kind of plants. Or if there is too much, they can go to a lower levels. Or if they don't like it too much, they can hide. So you have to give the ch chance to the individual to choose. And in this way, it's going to be more, uh, how do I say, uh, it's a better approach to work with uh, UV or um, illumination. In this uh, way, you have to set up your uh, aquarium like a cholute or terrarium to provide them the all the options that the, the frog can choose and also to see uh, which part of the terrarium you are going to install your lamp or what altitude is going to have your uh, terrarium to get enough uh, uv light so all these kind of things you should uh, think about in advance to see how is going where is going to be your lamp how is going to be your setup in this way, the frog is going to be able to choose not just the lowest uh, area of UV radiation, but also the highest, or if it's too dangerous, uh, to avoid these uh, situations. And also one thing that you need to think about is what kind of things you are going to put on top of your terrarium. Is Are you going to put just direct uh, the lamp inside your terrarium? Are you going to put a glass, plastic, a mesh, or what? Because uh, UV radiation is filtered by uh, glass, for example. UV radiation doesn't pass the glass. So if you have your lamp on top of the glass and then your glass and the terrarium, even if it's a very strong UV lamp, you are, the frog is not going to get any UV radiation. So you should use, for example, another kind of system. One thing is can be a mesh, for example, but also a mesh is going to decrease the UV radiation that is going to pass through the mesh. And depending on the distance, also is going to affect. So once you have your terrarium installed with your mesh on everything, or uh, there are also special plastics that filter not all the UV radiation, a little expensive, but you can use those. So you have to measure in your terrarium how much UV are they getting, uh, depending on the altitude of your of your lamp in your terrarium. 
So basically, you should think uh, about your species, uh, how much is the maximum UV radiation that are getting in the wild, and to try to understand, depending on the natural history of your species, how much they need or not. There is no rule, or you, you're going to say, this is the maximum radiation that they get in the wild, and they, they should get this. No, because this maximum can be also harmful for the frog. Maybe the frog is not choosing the highest uh, levels, but when the UV radiation is lower and they go out, so so you need to understand these kind of things and to try to uh, study this in the wild if possible. But if you don't have the chance to go to the wild, into the wild, you can add, add, at the beginning, uh, at least, when you install your terrarium with your UV lamp, to see regularly your frog, where the frog is uh, moving, and if he's trying to go closer to the lamp or go far away from the lamp, in this way, you can change the distance from your lamp or also to put some filters or some other things that are, is going to allow you to have the frog in a better, better conditions. Basically, this is... Um, kind of a small review about the UV lamp. There is no uh, special um, rules for uh, amphibians. There is not too much known about that. There are some experiments uh, people are doing with uh, frogs, uh, Sicilians, or uh, salamanders, and also with tadpoles. And we see that there are effects in the condition of the frogs, and especially with metabolic bond, uh, metabolic bond disease. And also with some uh, conditions with uh, uh, health conditions that are affecting uh, to the frogs. And for example, there are some experiments, the effect of UV radiation uh, versus chytrids. And they saw, for example, high levels of UV is going to decrease the chance to, for the frog to be infected by chytrids. So all these kind of things you should be think about if you are going to start uh, working with uh, UV. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if you have uh, some questions.